Welcome to another moment in the Word. How does the Bible guide your prayer, your praying, your time as you come before the Lord? We pray, Father, not my will, but yours be done. Well, what does that mean? How would you know his will? How does the Bible impact your prayer life? Well, that's what we're looking at. We're looking at verses 15 to 17 in the first chapter of Acts. And here's what we find. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together was about 120, men and brethren. This scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit by the mouth of David spoke before concerning Judas, who was guide to them that took Jesus, for he was numbered with us and had obtained part in this ministry. Well, as we're looking in the context here, Jesus had given a commission that they were to be witnesses. They were to be witnesses, and it was a global ministry. It would begin in the city of Jerusalem, and it would extend. And it would extend, but it would extend not just in geography. It would extend even over the generation since. And we see then that they were to wait. Jesus had told them to, not to leave Jerusalem, and they do. They abide in Jerusalem, they're in the upper room, and they continued, we find in verse 14, they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. We can't have a unity apart from prayer. It is prayer that brings us together because like the spokes of a wheel, the hub is God, the hub is Christ, and consequently we are drawn together in prayer. And what are they praying for? Well, that's what's interesting, and that's what we find in this passage. We find, and in those days, it's those days between the ascension of Jesus and Pentecost. He had, remember, been on the earth for 40 days, and then he ascended into heaven. Between the 40th day and the 50th day is the period of time, and as they're praying, Peter, now having stood up, he, and notice it's in the midst of them. He doesn't stand up and take a position of importance, but also notice something else, that Peter was one who had denied the Lord. And yet, even though he had denied the Lord, he found forgiveness and grace, and therefore he is not despised, he, he is not discredited, he is not disaffected, he instead has been now accepted by the brethren. And he stands up and he says to the brothers, he says the number of names that were gathered together was about 120. Well, the 120 is of the men that were there, not necessarily including the women. Now, the reason for that is that we find that the Greek is clear. It's in the masculine form, so it's referring to that. But we also know that Jesus had chosen this 12 to be then his followers. And therefore, we find also that those who are a part of this early decision-making to replace Judas, they had to be men and that's what we find actually as a minion in the Jewish congregation. A minion is a quorum. There had to be 10 men. If there is to be a, uh, a, a congregation, there had to be 10 men in order to have a synagogue. There had to be 120 that we find in the Mishnah in order to have a council. And so that is the, what's going on here is that there is the forming of an actual council, a form of a Sanhedrin that is now being created. And the creation is based on what scripture has said. They place a priority on the word of God. Notice what he says, men, brethren. 
Men is andros, it is the word you get uh, anthropology from, and you have uh, uh, the, the word brethren, and the word brethren keeps coming up. And, and the word brethren is really interesting because that literally, adelphos, means of the same womb. Uh, you are a part of the family of God. How could that be? It is because you are born again and your heavenly father is the same as my heavenly father. We may be divided by culture. We may be divided by distance. We may be divided by many things, but we find our unity in the spirit as a result of being born again. And so he says that Adelphos, notice that Peter is not speaking down to them. He is equating himself with them. And he says, men, brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled. This scripture, it's interesting, the word is graphe. It's the bigger picture of scripture. He is going to recite in, in verse 20, you will see specific Psalms that he is referring to, but he never loses sight of the bigger picture. And that is all scripture, and that is the same word, graphe, all scripture is given so that we might grow. But the word grama, the, the details, that is inspired by God. All of it is inspired of God. It is God breathed. And so he says, notice this, how he phrases this is amazing, that it must be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit by the mouth of David spoke. It wasn't David just himself coming up with the idea, let me write the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. That didn't come from David. No, it it's Peter who writes in First Peter chapter 2, that holy men of God wrote as they were moved or carried along like a ship. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit that moves you or me to then minister. It is my mind that directs my tongue. The tongue is merely what you're now hearing, but in reality, it is the Spirit of God that is directing the men of God to write what they wrote. And if you're involved in any kind of ministry at all, it better be more than your flesh, more than the tongue. It must be by the Spirit. That's what Paul later writes, he says, I don't come to you, Thessalonians, with the wisdom of men, but with the power of God, with much assurance and the Holy Spirit. And so consequently, it is the Holy Spirit. That's what they have understood. That's why it's so important that we know the word of God. It is also so in interesting that that that. Peter has no difficulty at all in citing these passages out of the book of Psalms. Why? It, we find later on in chapter 5 that the priests thought they were ignorant fishermen. But in reality, they knew the word of God. Do you know the word of God? The more you know the word of God, the more you memorize the word of God, the more the spirit of God will bring to your mind what the spirit has said. But notice now, as he is standing up, as they have been praying, as they have been seeking the supply that is needed, the spirit of God directs them to the word of God, what they need to pray for. And so oftentimes what we're praying for is some need that we have, financial, physical, or whatever. Nothing wrong with that. However, are we praying according to the will of God? Are we praying what he wants? And what he wants is according to what the scriptures have said. So we look at scripture and we see that there are mandates that are given to the church. 
For instance, we're to pray to the Lord of the harvest. He would send forth laborers. Are you praying that? Because that is the will of God. We're to be praying that there are witnesses, we're witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth, to the last soul until the Lord returns. Are you praying that? Are you praying that you're that witness? You see, that's how we find Peter now, taking the word of God, standing in the midst of these brethren and saying, here is what God has decreed. Here is what scripture has declared. Here's a need. And notice the Greeks thought of fate. They said things happen by chance. Now, that's not how the early believers believed. That's not how the Jewish people believed. That's not how those who live the scriptures believe. And that's not how Christians today believe. We know that in him we live, we move, we have our being, that his providence is all around us. His fingerprints are all over our lives, that it is God that is directing, and we're seeking an awareness in all of our ways to acknowledge him. And so he goes on to say that he had spoke concerning Judas, who was a guide to them who took Jesus. He brings to their mind what had happened only 40 days before. None of them thought Judas would betray Jesus. On the evening in which Jesus had declared, one of you shall betray me. All of them around the final last table, the last supper, they looked they didn't look at Judas. They looked at themselves and said, Lord, is it I? No, they didn't know. It was Judas until that night as they're in the Garden of Gethsemane and they see the torches. And then they see Judas leading the band that is coming to apprehend Jesus. Then they see. That's what now we have Peter citing that they all remember this and he's bringing this to their attention. And notice what it says, verse 17, for he was numbered with us. There was a number. Jesus had chosen 12, 12 disciples. Those 12 disciples would be like the 12 sons of Jacob. They would become tribes. They would become a wonderful uh, testimony of God's grace and providence to communicate and illustrate to the world what God can do. And now Jesus had chosen 12. Judas had been chosen. But notice Judas numbered with them. And the word for number there is the word you get your English word arithmetic. Oh, but he didn't quite add up, did he? No, because he was never one of them. And that's another reminder to us. You can serve in ministry. You can be active in the church. You can hold an office. You can be thought by others to be a wonderful example of God's grace. And in fact, you've never accepted Christ. You were never really, though you were numbered with them, never one of them. For notice it goes on to say, he had even attained a part of this ministry. He was a part of it. And the word for ministry is diakonos. It's the word we get our English word deacon from. And it means to serve. It's not an office. We don't see a distinction here as Peter is talking. Yes, he's an apostle. He's one of those that God had chosen to lay the foundation. You don't need another foundation. It's already laid. We build on Christ the cornerstone and the foundation of the apostles. However, please notice that Peter never thought of himself as better than any of the other apostles, and neither did the apostles think of themselves as better than the brethren. And notice, here is a man, Judas, that was serving. And Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. I came as a deacon. I came to serve. Is that you? Did you come and serve others? That is really one of the characteristics of a believer. 
is there's humility and there's concern for others, compassion, love that serves. I reminded also, as I look at this expression, he was numbered with us. Isn't that what Jesus is? He's numbered with us. You see, Judas was one who actually never was one of them, but he appeared to be. Jesus, on the other hand, was never one who was a sinner. He never sinned, but he was one of us. He was numbered with the transgressors. Oh, my dear one, he became part of us so that we could become part with him. He gave himself for us so that we can receive his spirit in order to serve God and others. I pray God blesses you today. Father, thank you for this. Thank you for what you have shared and how now Peter was stirred by scripture. Help us, Father, as we open your word to be stirred by scripture and to pray scripture, to pray your will. Father, thank you because your will will be accomplished. 